G'day humans, welcome to the safe space for dangerous ideas. Uh, here's a dangerous idea for you. Uh, imagine the cosmos that we inhabit being full of all the beautiful supernovas and uh, stars and black holes and galaxies that it is currently full of, but lacking one crucial component, consciousness, our ability to be self-aware, to be sentient, to ponder things, to feel like something, to have this conversation, to listen to, or now watch this podcast. If you're listening to this podcast and you're not watching it, we are now on YouTube. Just search for Josh Sepps uh, on YouTube and subscribe to the channel. Don't just watch one video. You need to subscribe. Uh, the riddle of how it comes to pass that stuff that is generated inside stars accretes on a rock that is whizzing around a blazing ball of flaming gas and assembles itself in such a way that it becomes your brain is a riddle of the millennia for the philosophers and the scientists and one person who has dedicated his life to thinking through the weird and wonderful ways that consciousness exists inside our heads and that our brains function is Joel Pearson who's the founder of the Brain and Mind Lab at the University of New South Wales and whose new book is The Intuition Toolkit. He's a, a friend of mine, a friend of my ABC show. It's his first appearance on Uncomfortable Conversations. Thank you, Joel. It's a pleasure. Uh, so how does it come to pass? Do we know that why it feels like something to be me? How long and doesn't <laughs> And doesn't not, minutes, do do, it. doesn't not feel like something well, to be me? Where's a good place to start? So it does seem that having a brain like yours results in Josh, right? Why that's the case is a little bit more complex. We don't have the real answer to that. But the sort of the idea behind this idea of monism that you are your brain or you is what your brain does is the fact that when you get something complex with 86 or so billion neurons and trillions of connections, that complexity and the way it interacts, the way it holds information seems to result in conscious awareness, consciousness. And that with all the past you have, all the experiences and all the learnings your brain has creates what it is to be like you. And that's the experience of being you. So it's an emergent, the fact that it feels like something to be me in a way that it doesn't feel like something to be a teacup is just an emergent property of the complexity of my brain? It seems to be. And we'll get to that whether, so some people will say it does feel like something to be a teacup, right? This is this emerging idea, which has come back into trend now, that everything's a little bit conscious right? Hard to test, very hard to test, very hard to know, but it's more of a philosophical idea. But yeah, that is the idea that there's something about the way the brain is wired, that it holds the information, what it does with the information, the way it's integrated, the way it's bounced around in there. There are different theories about this, some controversial, some not. Um, and it's just simply what it feels like to have that system and have information live in that system. But that, so that, that, and that means that it's a certainty that computers will be sentient. So that basic theory, yeah, suggests, and it's kind of linked into this panpsychism we'll get to, I think, and it's very shortly, um, that, yeah, if you create anything with that kind of structure, that the nature of, of a human brain, then, hey, you, it'll, it'll feel like something to be that. But that, Whether that's, that's a, a supercomputer... I still don't quite uh, get it because there are already artificial systems that are heaps more complicated than the most rudimentary living systems or the most rudimentary sentient Living systems, aren't they? I mean, would well, be like a yeah, more GPT, complex than a, sea, than a sea slug or something. But yeah. not, the human we haven't mapped the human brain. No, so but, um, but not only humans are sentient. Like yeah. let's let's go down to like a, an animal that we could all agree is sentient. Maybe it's not a sea slug, but it probably is. Certainly, I don't know, an ant. Would you say or a grasshopper or something like it? I mean, it's, we don't know. That's and so the, the the weird twist in all this is we don't have a test for consciousness. There's no meter I can stick in your head and say, oh, he seems to be conscious. Tick, and that applies to AI, to mice, to cats, to dogs, to ants, to amoeba, whatever it is. And so we think this is great. People are comfortable with this idea as a gradation of sort of a scale of conscious awareness or sentience. As you go down, it gets less so, but it still feels like something to be a mouse, an ant, or a bacteria. Yeah, right? like, what well, that bacteria? Be, I don't know. Like, we don't know. Here's a thought experiment that I find useful in this kind of conversation. You go to bed tonight, you wake up in the morning, and you're a chimp. Yeah. yeah. Right? Uh, that's scenario A. Scenario B is you go to bed tonight, you wake up in the morning... And you're a saucepan. 
<laughs> yeah, sure. Now, I think everyone's going to go, oh, I'll be the chimp. I mean, I can imagine that there's an interiority to the life of a chimp. Like, the, to be a chimp is not to have the lights go out completely inside your yes your head. Yeah. To turn into a saucepan... Unless you unless you're a talking dancing saucepan in a Disney musical, is to have is to die. You might as well be nothing. Yeah. You might as well just not exist, or a rock. So we think, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, to all intents and purposes, as far as what I, as far as the bar that I would impose on what I want sentience to feel like, even if there, even if panpsychism were real and everything is a little bit conscious, the amount of consciousness that is evidenced by a rock is so subtle, yeah. I would regard that as synonymous low, with dying. Exactly, yeah. So, yeah. you know, I wake up as a chimp, that's one thing. Now I wake up as a mouse or a dog or a, or something, that's a different thing. I wake up as a grasshopper, I'm still probably choosing grasshopper over rock, right? My intuition is it probably feels like something to be a grasshopper. Yes, we think so. We don't really know. We don't know, right? But let's, so let's, let's their just... behavior suggests it, it may, right? And some, probably not a grasshopper, but as you move up the chain, they they respond to pain in, in interesting ways that seem more and more similar to us. And when you get to larger animals, they seem to have richer, you know, emotional lives, cognitive lives, psychological lives, and things like that. Which the way we interpret that is that they have similar minds and thinking approaching us, right? I mean, you know, this skepticism you could even apply to other other members of the same species of Homo sapiens. You don't yeah. know for sure that I'm yeah, and that's the sentient. Yeah, that's what it comes down right. to. We could you could be a robot, you could be yeah. a zombie, you could be one of the Westworld, whatever they're called. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but at some point we give the benefit of the doubt to the creature that seems alive. Yes. So just in order to understand this consciousness being an emergent property of complexity argument. Let's take the simplest possible animal that we could agree is probably sentient. What would you want that to be? I don't, uh, should we go? We can go a mouse, a rat, a, a rat, mouse. Or okay, somewhere people often feel comfortable somewhere. There. Mammals, yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, mammals, yeah. Uh, uh, so a mouse, and then you compare that to Chat GPT or Deep Blue or whatever the computer was. Yeah. You know, one of these supercomputers. I don't quite understand why there isn't sentience in the computer but there is in the mouse because the computer seems to me to be more complicated than the mouse yeah so it's a complex there's a lot to unpack there so so one with with the computers and with gpt and with all the current ais i think we're being tricked a little bit i think we think of them as intelligent right they display intelligence which is heavily biased because of the language because they're very good with language and we seem to interpret that as intelligence whether there's a lot going on under that it's hard to know Right, but so they're complex. They are, let's just park. Complex like, like, yeah. uh, let's park the question of whether artificial intelligence yeah. will become sentient. Yeah, and just try to understand what we mean when we say that it that the feeling of feeling like I'm alive, of the lights being on, is an emergent property of complexity. Because I'm skeptical about this. It doesn't just doesn't feel right. Like there are really complicated. Like forget about ChatGPT. There are aeroplanes. There are fighter jets that are more complicated than a mouse, aren't there? I don't know about that. Could be. I don't know. Because it depends how you Might define be, yeah. more complex. I mean, uh, mouse brains are already pretty complex. There's a lot of neurons in there. I can't remember how many. But certainly, uh, yeah, more complex than a plesia or a sea slug or something like that, I'd say, maybe. Give or take. But then, so wait, so so if it's not emergent and it's not a property of the brain, what do you, what do you think it is? Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> where, where are we going? <laughs> I'm with playing this? devil's advocate. Where I'm going is like there's some kind of sprinkle of pixie dust on right, biology. Okay. That facilitates consciousness. So that, uh, is that sounds like dualism. Is that what? I'm yeah. Should we talk about dualism? So this idea that yeah that so so if if the mind is separate to the brain, it's something magical that 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 the brain somehow creates, and we don't know how it does that. Um, but it's separate to that. It's not something. It's it's not the same thing. So the example you gave before, right? So you, you, we just pull you out and put you in a chimp, right? That kind of smells like dualism to me, right? Because you say, well, and a lot of movies do this, right? People, you know, whatever, get drunk and wake up and they're in a different body. Well, and it's, it's comedy ensues, right? So so, the, so people are pretty comfortable with that idea that you can just pull yourself out of a body and put yourself in someone else's body. Um, but that idea kind of, there's almost no support for something like that in science, right? So you are in, linked to the specific bespoke wiring of your brain, 
which is linked to the specific wiring and the muscles in your body. Um, when you learn something that the brain rewires, and that is very specific to the architecture, to your DNA, to your everything in your body. So the idea of ripping your, yourself out of that somehow and just plugging it into a totally different structure, you know, if you could somehow magically do that, you wouldn't have the memories. You, would, you wouldn't be Josh anymore. You'd just be a chimp. And you, right. you, you, your memories would be gone. You wouldn't know that you used to be Josh and you'd never go back. The only way you could do it would be by removing your brain from your head and putting your brain into someone else's body. Would that do it? It, it Possibly. Right, like a like, like surgical thing, yeah. like a physical, yeah. Physically. Uh, right, but then you just have an augmented body, right? Yeah, then I'm just me in someone else's body. Yeah. Like... We could do an arm transplant. Like it's like a, it's a big version of transplanting your limbs or something, or, or um, yeah, right, your heart right, or whatever. Right, it's just doing you're basically that more just more transplanting every single limb. Yeah, uh, including so, all yeah, of my organs. Yeah, you could do that, and and you know that will probably be possible one day. Would that change who you are? That's an interesting question. I don't think we know the answer to that. There's some interesting. Is there science around that? There is some. People who have heart transplants. I want to say they have reported feeling different or feeling different emotionally in this way and that way after they've had the heart transplant. But it's a pretty traumatic thing to go through. Yeah, exactly. Drugs and a lot of this and a lot of that. So it's very hard to know how to interpret that. Yeah. Okay, so, so. dualism is scientifically poo-pooed, but is probably <laughs> the most common uh, belief in the world. I mean, yeah. like it, we're intuitively we're all dualists. People feel like it. We feel like we're it not. It feels like me that's doing the talking, you know, I could just cut off my limbs and everything and I'd be still be me. It doesn't matter, right? Yeah. The body doesn't really matter. And then people keep taking that all the way up to here to the brain, right? But the data doesn't really support that. So the, and if you're a religious person, you don't really care about the data because you can say, well, uh, you know, I have a spirit, I have a soul, uh, it's eternal. Um, don't ask me any more questions about how that works yeah, because right, I can't yeah. explain it. It's just a, fa it's a faith thing. And Dualism, I would say, is intrinsic to religious belief. Yeah, you can't have an afterlife beyond the body unless dualism is true. Unless there's a there's a you that's different from the firings of the synapses and the neurons in your brain. Um, on the other hand, if you're a materialist and you just believe that, you know, the the mind is the that our sentience and our consciousness are are emergent properties of the physicality of our body. Does that necessarily mean that you're not a dualist? Like, is there a place for dualism in materialism? Uh, <laughs> I guess you could try and come up with something. What would you call it? Some kind of pixie dust. Yeah, scenario, the pixie like dust pixie scenario. Dust or that there's something well, special about meat. Right. Maybe so it's not dualism. Be, maybe it is a mo maybe the it, biology is. Special the biology, and... yes, that there's a capacity for biology to become self-aware that non-biological systems don't have. So now we're talking That's about... That's one possibility, yeah. yeah. We don't know what that would be yet because in theory, everything we can map from the way neurons interact and the way they'd be wired together, you could mimic um, with a computer, with software or with hardware. Um, and that's kind of how some of these deep learning, you know, machine learning networks actually work. So... But that remains, you know, a possibility. Absolutely, yeah. What that you could? Oh, no, there's the something special about special. biology. There's something yeah. that you couldn't. In other words, there's something extra, extra, more than the sum of the parts. Yes. When you add it, when you do with bi that, you bring together with biology that you wouldn't get with chips or with simulated neurons or there's whatever. There's something that the rat yeah. is bringing to the table. Yeah. That is not just the same as the fighter jet. Yeah. But you don't like that idea. It's a possibility. I mean, I don't, I don't think we have enough evidence to, to go in that direction at this stage. Do we have enough evidence to understand how sentience arises out of information processing? No, I mean, not really. There's a, there's a couple of theories. And so one of them, the information integration theory, which sparked us some controversy recently, um, uh, is one of the leading ones. Global workspace theory would be another one. So, and it's interesting, this theory, the, the IIT, the Information Integration Theory, has been around for, I don't want to say, at least 10 years plus. Um, and it's heavily mathematical, and it's based on some, what do they call them, probably axioms, on how what it feels like to be conscious, right? And then it launches, so it's a little bit philosophical, but then it launches into heavy math very quickly. Um, 
So a couple of months ago, a group of over a hundred scientists, neuroscientists, signed a letter saying it's pseudoscience. And this created, you know, it, this is pretty nerdy you know, controversy, but it created a, a you know, a, a little, a lot of excitement amongst colleagues and people like, oh my God, pseudoscience is such a strong word. How can you say this? And people saying that's going to bring the whole consciousness field down. Everyone's going to just write it off, write the whole thing off now as being pseudoscience when it's not. Um, so people pushed back and said that. And what claim exactly strong. was being accused of being pseudoscientific? Just the theory itself. What is the theory? So, it's, <laughs> so, so that it's very hard to explain without getting into the math. So it, it's it's based on some of the. So the best way to describe it would be that when information is integrated in a complex system, the more complex it is, and the more integrated it is, the more conscious it is. And integrated it, meaning the more connected. Basically, the there's a strict mathematical is. definition of that that I right. can't bring to so mind So lots right and now, lots of information and all of the bits of information are connected in sufficiently complicated ways yeah. that gives rise to the feeling of and the information having a soul. When you do that, whether it's in a plant or an iPhone or a human, you get some level of consciousness. So it's, it plugs straight into panpsychism. Right. Um, and, and there's other things, you know, there's, there's assumptions made in there that consciousness is absolute. It's like all or nothing. You can't be half conscious and some other things like that. And, and people object to, and, and I, and I kind of, I didn't sign the letter, but I relate to this, um, that it's a good theory should be falsifiable. It should be very clear which experiments you could do, which would rule that theory out. That's sort of part of the basis of science. And it's very hard to do that with this theory for a couple of reasons. One is for the, the thing phi is the thing you calculate with this integration calculation and to do that for a human brain is so far beyond any computers there's no way we can do that right now right we struggle to do that with a mouse brain and so it's very hard to test this theory and so you therefore very hard to falsify it so it's non-falsifiable is that a scientific theory and that's kind of where they were going with this letter right okay what's yeah. the alternative hypothesis well there's one there's another there's there's not that many. That's the I mean, problem. so the people who are signing this letter saying uh, this this new field of information theory is bunk, is pseudoscience. What would they prefer to believe about how consciousness arises? They want to do more empirical research. They want to improve the theory to make it falsifiable. Um, have it be, sort of move it away. Uh, I guess move it away from philosophy a bit. Have it more falsifiable um, and more based in data rather than sort of because the way the theory is, but it is based on like oh. Being conscious of the color red feels all or nothing, absolute. Therefore, we'll make the theory, the mathematics like that. And so there's like there's, there's a couple of steps like that. Where it's I just, thought you were saying that this m bumps into a kind of a panpsychism, but that doesn't yeah, that, sound like an all or nothing theory. Panpsychism sounds incrementalist. It, it, it is that, but in terms of the way consciousness is defined, it's it's like you can't have a, a, a you can't be h half conscious. There's just these five units of consciousness. And so it does it, sound it, like pseudoscience it gets, when you put sorry, it like that. It's, it's, it sounds like Dianetics or like, yeah, yeah it sounds so it, like... It's uh, never sat... It, I mean, whenever I... So Giulio Cianotti is the guy that came up with it. When I you know, sat with him and talked about it, like, oh, this all makes sense. This is amazing. And then a day later, you're going, wait a second. Mm. It's kind of just... It sounds like you just made up that part. Or like, I don't, I don't know. It's just there's something about it that never sat well with me. Right. I didn't sign the letter because I just thought it was a, it was a, it was a strong call to start, yeah. start, start throwing around pseudoscience. Um. So the so this idea about consciousness being binary. Let's just set, yeah pause on that for a second before we get to pan. Oh, absolute kind of or is. absolute. But like it, it also like applies to like I said, the way you calculate phi is about the integration. If you have like a little circuit with little on off switches, like you you'd make maybe in high school, like a little electrical circuit that can carry bits of information and they can be technically integrated very simply. And so that would have a very low level of phi, which means it should be conscious. And that so, circuit should be conscious. Yeah, and so that's what, so, so that's why this thing plugged. This kind of helped reignite this panpsychism wave that's bouncing around at the moment. Um, what is this panpsychism? Let's go there then. What is so, this so panpsychism pan, so wave? It literally means something like like mind everywhere, or everything has mind, and it's this idea that consciousness is fundamental to existence. That you can't have matter without it. Some also some kind of consciousness coming along with it. Right. So every atom and everything, every table and glass and everything in this room is a little, ha, brings with it consciousness somehow. It's it's just, an, it's part of the nature of reality. You can't have a thing without it being a little bit conscious. Right. Right. And, and this pretty theory achieves what? 
what problem does it solve? Like, why does it? Person. Um, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, you need to steel man your opponents here. I, I'm not a, I'm not a fan of it because it's like, well, it's, that's an interesting theory, but what's the data for it, right? And so that's I'm very practical with that kind of thing, right? So, and when you when I've been to conferences where there've been workshops on this, you know, people will talk about plants moving towards the light and going around a maze, and that's is that's that's evidence of complex behavior and the bee dance and the, you know all the complex. But that's not consciousness. That's like complexity, intelligence, and other other words feel better to me. That's not really getting to the nature of insects and other small things being conscious. And so I don't see so it doesn't, it any still doesn't data resolve to the this. problem for me of computers that we don't think of as being conscious, exhibiting much more sophisticated decision making mm. than things that we do think of as being conscious. Yeah, it, it. I'm still stuck on that. Maybe I'm misunderstanding something, but it's it strikes me that. We can put together extremely complicated syst- artificial systems that nobody ascribes sentience to, like a fighter jet. And then there are other systems that we do intuitively believe are sentient, like a mouse, that are not as complicated. So there's something yeah, about the way that we're doing the complexity. I would say that's largely a cognitive bias of humans, what you just described. So I think if so, if you put if you put ChatGPT into a little cute furry thing. And then showed it to people. They would start, you know, they would start treating it like a like an animal, like a mouse, and they would feel differently to thinking about it as a chatbot. On the, like, so in other words, we're very easy to fool. And, and when we see agency and we see like a character and any of those things that look like there's some agency in something, we start to you know think of it as something that might be alive and therefore might be conscious, right? Yeah, right. There's these classic experiments where you'd have like a a triangle on a square on a computer screen, just a simple outline, that's it. And one's bigger than the other, and the big one goes bang, and the little one like jumps away, and then it goes bang, and then the, like that, and people go, oh, the square's a bully. <laughs> oh, look, it's, it's bullying the other one, the other one's upset. And like, and that's two shapes outline. And then people right. start adding or anthropomorphizing them, adding all this stuff that they're, there's characteristics, and they're like little characters, and they, and it's simple as that, and you, you get that already. Right. And so there's this layer of, you, Humans are like that. We like to map the way we think of ourselves onto things, whether it be mm. animals, AIs, or shapes. Right. But you're sounding quite panpsychic there in the sense that per, per, you're, you're, in, you're hinting that possibly the fighter jet is mm. at least as sentient as the mouse and that, or that it's a cognitive bias. No, I, I think, think we, that we, we, we start believing sentient. that without realizing we're believing that. We start thinking that as a nat- part of human nature, whether it's true or not. That's another thing, but right, okay. we have a bias, yes. like, and that's why everyone thinks that the, you know G- GPT is so intelligent and it's, it's probably it be conscious, right? It's, and I don't think it's either of those two things yet. Yeah, um, but we can't help but feel that. Mm. I mean, there are even it's even funny the way that we have biases towards the what we feel are the characteristics of, of other animals or inanimate objects on the basis of what they look like and what we find cute and stuff. I mean, that's a whole conversation for another day, but. You know, Sam Harris has made the point that a, a, a squirrel is basically a rat with a bushy tail, and the bushy tail is <laughs> doing a, a lot of rat. a it's lot a of legwork. Uh, you know, in in plucking our heartstrings. Yeah, uh, and then you put you the know. glider wings between the legs. Yeah, and, and all and of a sudden like, oh, it's my cute. God, it's it's, oh, this rat is catch. adorable because it has yeah. a bushy tail. Uh, you know, we have these. Well, the bush cockroach and the house cockroach, the same thing. But like, yeah, I don't. I'll, I, I'm, I'll, t- I'll say no to all of the cockroaches. <laughs> Thank you, Joel. Uh, and so panpsychism. I mean, let me be more generous to the yeah. panpsychist then. Then than you're willing to be. The problem it solves, as I understand it, is all of a sudden you don't have to figure out how it comes to pass that all shit that's been spewed out from stars becomes <laughs> self-aware, yeah, right? And to, becomes sentient. Like, like, there's this huge problem. Get rid of the hard problem. As, as yeah, there's, yeah exactly. Like, so yeah. let's talk about that. I, for, wish, I should have said that. What's the hard problem of consciousness? So it comes back to like dualism and how, uh, how can something that is meat or fat and nerves um, create something that seems to be not physical, the mind, right? And how do you go from there, from one to the other? And then how does the mind, which seems to be not physical, control the physical and things like that, right? And so if you, and so people get stuck on this, how do you get past this hard problem? It came up in philosophy I don't know, a while ago now. And so yeah, panpsychism seems to sort of, you know, it's it's just there, All it's always been there, it's always gonna be there. It's just a, it's a fundamental, part of the universe let's say and so there's no hard problem right yeah and the and the way that it manifests itself is that these 
subtly conscious building blocks of the universe, when assembled in certain ways, are able to exhibit their consciousness yes. in a more macro manner. They would start showing like behavior, mind. which we would we would interpret. But, yeah. but if, before they could do behavior, there'd be some level of consciousness. And then you don't need to inject consciousness. It avoids the problem of... It's just always there. At what point in evolution did sentience emerge and how? Uh, or yeah. at what point in the evolution of a human fetus or a human you know, human being, when when did my sentience come into being? Like, these are all very thorny problems, aren't they? If yeah. you're not a panpsychist. Yeah, so you've got to solve these problems. If it's always there, it's always there. It's like a fundamental, it's like gravity or something. It's just yeah. there. And I think people like that because it, 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 well, it solves that problem. But also, I mean, people like to think consciousness and being human is kind of special as well. I think it also speaks into that a little bit, right? That there's something yeah. special. That, and therefore, it, it feels special. It must be universal and always around or something. But I mean, it's also nice to... It's 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 bamboozling. Carl Sagan put his finger on how bamboozling it is that the cosmos is as big as it is if it's just a backdrop against which human beings are struggling against good and evil. So yeah. if the backdrop is humming with the vibrations of its own sentience, then all of a sudden that makes more sense, I think. It's like, oh, okay, well, the cosmos is vast and ineffable because it's some kind of a mind. Yeah, it certainly changes right? the, yeah, changes cosmology. An empty and wasteland. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, an empty, dark, cold wasteland in which we're yeah. lost in a random and corner I, of it. That kind of sounds nice, right? It's yeah. a little bit comforting, a little bit... Whether it's true, I mean... I don't know. I'm not. You want to see the test. I don't like getting. On, build, I don't like getting on build bandwagons a universe in your or, lab. Yeah, and I mean, whether it's free will or this or I, like, there people like to get on these teams and get political about it. And I'm, you know, I'm against this person or against with this person. And it's like, well, let's just let's strip that away and look at the data and think about, yeah, what 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 would the, what, what is falsifiable? What's not? What experiments could we do which could speak to this? How do we move the conversation and the understanding forward? I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I kind of. Have a, a love-hate relationship with philosophy. I used to love it, but the more philosophy conferences I go to, the more I hate it. But and and that's being unfair to philosophers. But this is well, a lot of them are doing bad philosophy. I mean, there just, was a there's, there's an addiction to making things super complex. I yeah, find. there's a few yeah, which don't. Yeah, but there's too many. But like, that's a perversion of philosophy. I mean, philosophy used to be about making sense. I mean, I say used to be like yeah. I was around at the time of yeah. the Stoics or Aristotle or <laughs> something, but like. I think the 20th century did a great disservice to philosophy because it all became about the meaning of meaning and like, you know, subtextual and kind of super textual Foucauldian, like, you know, yeah. masturbation <laughs> competitions, basically. I mean, I don't have co-authored papers or try to, like, it's like, well, I'm, they'll write some, and I will read them. I, I don't I have no idea what you're trying to no, say. No, exactly. Right? And I, and I, am I the target audience? Prob I, I, sh I should know. So, and they say, oh, I just mean this. I'm like, just say that. Yeah, right? yeah. And I would believe if you're going to write about something complex, you should use pretty simple language. Yes. If you're writing about something very simple, it's it's more appropriate to use complex language. That's fine. Yeah. Well, they're talking but, about things that are so fucking simple, they're not even, they don't even make any sense. That's why they have to dress <laughs> it up with so many fancy yeah. words to make it sound like they're saying something. I mean, and in terms of, I'll throw one more thing in. And so what happened, you know, when, so consciousness used to be sort of in the realms of the esoteric and the mystical and philosophers. And then neuroscience, probably in the, somewhere in the 90s, started asking these questions and looking at these topics with fMRI, brain scans, and other techniques. And so then neuroscientists, us neuroscientists, started talking more like philosophers. And we started asking these empirical questions about consciousness and then writing about it like a philosopher would in the discussion part of a paper. And we saw this interesting thing where a lot of the stuff they would talk about around consciousness now became the realm of empirical scientists. And there was this shift there. And then once that started happening, I see it as it, it became harder and harder for philosophers to keep up with the methods and the machine learning, this, the, that, right? Because you've got to just keep reading these papers all the time. If you're not doing the experiments, sometimes it can be pretty hard to understand how they work yeah. and therefore interpret them. So the job of a philosopher came, if you want to study uh, or think about consciousness, there's a, lot, there's a lot to read, there's a lot to understand. And if you're not doing brain scans or designing experiments and running participants, it can be somehow, you know, hard to get to the center of that. And so then there are two ways in which I could see, speaking of machine learning and artificial intelligence and chat GPT and stuff, there are two ways I can see of getting to a belief that these systems will 
become sentient or that there's some sentience functioning there. As you yeah. mentioned, you could be a panpsychist and, and you could say, you know, consciousness is humming along in the background in all matter. And so these things will become sentient because they're made of matter. Yeah. But you could also just be a, what's the opposite of a dualist? Monism. A modest, materialist, or modest, a materialist modest, yeah. right? A we are our brain. Our brain. Is we modest. are our yeah. brain. Yeah. That's all I am, and channeling Ray Kurzweil, I'm just gonna replicate exactly what's going on in in between my ears, but instead of building it out of carbon, I'm gonna build it out of silicon in a computer chip, and it's gonna be identical to my brain, and then that system will by definition feel like feel exactly like me yeah. and will have the sentience of me because we've already established that consciousness is just an emergent property of information processing. So if it's processing exactly the same information as I am, then it will have my memories. Yeah. It will have my soul. It'll be a clone of Josh, yeah. And I don't quite understand how people who believe in the singularity like Kurzweil expect to get their soul into that like I still don't right. understand, like, yeah. you know, it'll be, wants a to it'll be a different person. It'll be a different person. It'll be like having an identical twin. But how does... See, the problem for me with consciousness yeah. that always blows my mind is, like, it's still... Even when you do all of that legwork of transcribing my brain into another system, there's still this, like, Buddhist flickering light of self-awareness that is functioning somewhere in my soul or mind that I wouldn't know how to transfer into that system. There still seems to be a me that's underlying all of the so it, brain. So let's say we scan your brain and we instantly clone it and then I kill you and at the same time, exact same time, switch on the new one. Yeah. Do you just keep going? You just keep talking as you were. Like everything's the same. Yeah. Does it feel like you're still you? My intuition but then is what that I don't feel, switch My intuition off. is that I die and a new clone of me just keeps on talking that doesn't, that isn't me. But if it has all the memories and it, everything's the same, then it kind of is you. And if you, but if I don't switch, if I don't kill you or switch you off, then there's two Joshes walking around with the same history, the same memories, the same everything, two identical versions, right? Yeah. Which gets a little weird. Well, exactly. As soon as you're separate, you start diverging somehow. It's like the Star Trek, you know, machine that zaps you from one location to another, right? right. And it okay, does it. Yeah. It does it by replicating all of the <laughs> atoms in your body in another location. Well, is it actually zapping you or is it killing you here yeah, and reassembling yeah. a new a clone of you over there? Same thing, yeah. Yeah. What's your intuition? It probably doesn't matter. I mean, it's if they're both you, right? They're both so you're both going to be you, so you have two of you. Once there's two of you going, you're going to diverge and become different straight away. As soon as time passes, some experience. Uh, and then over more time, you're going to be more and more different, like identical twins, I guess. Um, but I, th in theory, from what we know, it, it should be like that. So it should be the same either way. So it's like, it, should be, it should feel like you're being transported, even if you're not. I don't believe that you think that it makes no difference because I don't <laughs> believe that if I was a mad scientist yeah. and... You know, at the end of this podcast, after you finish your tea, you fall Let's asleep because I've drugged your tea, and then you wake up and you're in a dungeon, and I've got you strapped up to a machine. I'm relaxed now. And I say, uh, I say, I've I've cloned you. I'm about to flick the switch on the clone. I can either, as soon as I flick the switch on the clone, I can shoot you in the head, or I can shoot the clone in the head. Which do you want me to do? Yeah, I don't believe you would say toss a coin makes no difference. Both will be me. I think you'd say shoot the fucking clone. Yeah, yeah, I would. Yeah. That's yeah. a safer option. Unless you said, oh, the clone has a, you know, a body of a, it, it's, it's the body's better, the things that it's going to live for longer, it's somehow improved. And right. Like, but then you would mm. make a selfless, but then you would be making a selfless decision to sacrifice your life for the clones. Not that you, yeah. not that, that would cause you to believe that you're going to leap your consciousness, your sense of yeah. being alive is going to leap into the clone. Yeah. I, I, it's, a, it's an empirical question. I don't think we know the answer. So it's going to be a gamble either way, either way, right? Right, but if our hunch is that that it's not exactly the same, then there's something about consciousness or sentience that is not just the sum of the parts of what's going on inside our head. Maybe, or it's just the fear of the thing that we could, the fear that it could be wrong. 
right? Like it's like, even though I believe that, I'm still like, it still make, freaks me out to, <laughs> to be shot in the head or whatever, right? So I'm still going to be scared of that because it's, it's a bit, it is going to be, it's not a done deal. It's not a known thing. Um, so it doesn't, it, it, it's not, in other words, it doesn't mean that I secretly think there's some pixie dust involved. It just means that that freaks me out a bit, I think. So do you think that when Ray Kurzweil does build a machine that is identical in terms of its information processing to his brain, yeah. that that will be a moment at which he will achieve the immortality of that machine, like the actual sense of the feeling of being him, himself, or will there be a new feeling of himself in the machine? If there's nothing special about the biology, then it should be the same, right? And so, which is interesting because you don't have to up this idea we have to upload to the cloud, but you don't in this case you don't have to upload because you've cloned it exactly. So the upload is part of the clone. Um, but yeah, if there's nothing different, there's nothing special about biology and, and wetware, then it sh then it should be the same. But is it the same? Is it a new version of the same thing, like an identical twin, or is it actually, or do you start seeing out of that thing's eyes? <laughs> well it can be it can be both those things kind of it can be new but the moment you're there you still you feel like you you, you finish the sentence you're saying you yeah, have to old ray right old ray's he's still, still going alive. he's still going yeah so why is the he not second there's two they start diverging right? i see but in the instant so as as the new one switched on let's say he finishes the thought that the old one was having but then straight away, if he sees himself... Oh, I see what gonna, you're saying. So, so for an instant, the it's one, the same They're the same, but person, straight away... And then just, straight away, they become yeah, different experiences. Yeah, is it, is it misalignment, or they're just going to go off in slightly different directions. Right. Yeah. I think that's the, So you think consciousness is sort of divisible in that way, in a sense. You, you could have a... Un, you could have a... Yeah, I mean, if it is just a consequence of the firing of information... Yeah, then, unless there's something... Unless there's pixie dust with the biology, then, then everything, I think pretty much works right yeah so there, but there's caveats there we're a long way off that and so but, is, but isn't isn't i'm just wrestling with this so the the me that is talking right now yeah in your worldview is not necessarily the same as the me that was talking a few seconds ago because you Correct. could have created a clone of me and we're not right we're not we're changing what, but what, it still feels like there's a continuity of my own experience of the world. That, oh, there definitely is. But you're different from moment to moment, right? Your brain's right. different. And your you could clone different. me now. Your and wants and that, wishes are different. That second version of me would have just as intense uh, an impression of continuity as I do, even if they hadn't felt their toe being cut on a glass <laughs> a couple of weeks ago because it wasn't actually their toe. They would have the, all the memories... Right, it's a memory. How thing. do you know it was your toe? Yeah, I don't. Yeah. So the same thing would hold, right? So you could be a clone. I could have just made you now in a lab, right? And yeah. put all the memories in there, like one of the Westworld, um, what are they called? Whatever they're called. Yeah. The robot -y things. Yep. Um, and you can't tell the difference. Or, you know, Blade Runner, one of the Blade Runners. Yeah, yeah. okay. So you're, in other words, your whole, all your memories could be fabricated. Yes, and does it make a difference? I mean, not only my memories, but, um, you know, as per the matrix, the reality right now could be fabricated as well. Right. So simulation, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that plugs into Descartes, dualism, you know, the matrix. Yeah. Musk's, we're on a simulation. There's no way to tell. <laughs> right. And this, I, I don't know by the thing that he says that, oh. It's almost certain it, it, that it's, we're it's, in it's a It's certain. Simulation. It's like 99%. And I, I don't see why that's the case. That doesn't really seem, the logic doesn't really seem to work there, for, I think. But. Well, I can't see why it's not the case, but there's something fishy about it, nonetheless. I just, but I don't know what's fishy about it. So for people who don't know, the argument is that if it ever comes to pass, that it will feel like something to be a computer program. Yeah. Because like, you know, computer, like avatars in computer games are so sophisticated that they become, they, that sentient. Sent, they become yeah. sentient somehow, right? Yeah. If it's true that information processing is what gives rise to sentience, then at some point in the future, it's almost inevitable that we will have systems inside computers yeah. that feel like something to be them. Yeah. Characters in simulations games or movies. Simulations, like a game right? Or something. Yeah. And the number of those will certainly vastly outnumber the number of biological humans because they're so much easier to make and everyone will I have guess. the ability to populate 
worlds, I mean, even teenagers will be playing around with computers that are sophisticated enough to create little yeah. avatars and simulations. But that's simulations a lot of ifs there, right? People. That's the thing. It's a lot of ifs. So, but just to follow his his argument through to, to to let it land, that means that at any point in the future, if that happens at any point in the future, then it is already true that we're almost certainly in one of those simulations at some point in the future because they will run, people will run all kinds of alternative uh, hypotheses of like, how would the world have gone if we hadn't done anything about climate change? Let's run a simulation model of what would have happened if Diana had died in a car accident. Let's run a simulation model of what would have happened if there was a pandemic in 2020. Uh, You know, and so everyone's going to be running, part of our part of a responsible species research project, quite apart (laughs) from its recreation, would be to run lots and lots of simulations with lots and lots of human-like characters in those computer games and there would be trillions and trillions at a minimum of these things therefore the likelihood that we are actually one of the original biological creatures upon which those simulations are based is vanishingly small yeah yeah. so it goes i I, I buy all of that but i I also share your your intuition that there's some 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 fishy about it but but it assumes that well somewhere in the future but we would want to do that that it would be necessary to answer those questions. Like, would we need to run all those simulations to answer these questions? Maybe there's going to be much easier ways to answer these questions. Maybe we won't care about answering those questions. Maybe we won't care about, maybe simulations won't hold attention. Maybe we won't run sim. There's like so many ifs and buts there yeah. that I just think like, I mean, sure, me, all the- those things fall in line and we have to do those things. We People get obsessed with the simulations and we run them maybe like pets or maybe like ex- scientific experiments or whatever, then sure. But there's a couple of big ifs there. Yeah, I mean, one of the big ifs is that it's going to be trivially easy to produce human-style consciousness in artificial systems. Yeah. And that that's going to be a sufficiently low-cost endeavor that you're going to have trillions of these things. Like, to me, that's... It reminds me a bit of, like, at each moment of human evolution, we always tend to assume that the universe is like whatever our latest technology is. Yeah. So like in the 1800s, you know, they were like, the cosmos is like a giant steam engine, you know, yeah, with yeah. pumps and, you know, yeah, whistles. Yeah, same with things. the brain it's and like, the mind. It's like you know, whatever yeah. the cutting edge technology is, you sort and of map it. Computer and now to think. Yeah, exactly. So now we're like, oh, the universe is a giant we computer. Like yeah, because we're in a computer era. Of yeah. course, Elon Musk thinks, thinks it's like a giant computer. Yeah. He's a computer guy. Uh, if he was alive in the 1700s, he'd think it's like a steam train, you know? Uh, We're all steam trains. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Exactly. Well, that like the body is a bunch of pistons and, yeah. uh, and, that, and that sort of thing. Um, yeah. So I don't, I don't know. But there's, there's too many ifs in that. All right. So, but let's just pair it back to the more plausible question then about whether or not, since consciousness and like the mind is your work, will, will uh, an artificial system ever feel like something to be it? I think it probably will. Yeah, I don't see. I don't see. Again, it falls back to there's something magical, special about biology, but we don't. We haven't got evidence of that yet. So I don't see why an AI won't become sentient and conscious. I don't think it's not there yet, and we don't have a test for that. Right? There's the Turing test, the Lovelace test, and then there's people are trying to. Critique. What's the Lovelace test? Oh, it's like a, it's like the, a, a, a version, an updated version of the Turing test based on being creative, right? So GPT and or any, lots of those systems have passed both those tests like a while ago earlier in the year right uh and there's other versions of tests but they're not really about it's amazing that a while ago is like yeah I know. <laughs> just when i was young in 2023 like yeah, it's moving so fast yeah. like we may be at the precipice of an entirely new chapter of human civilization and uh you know you say like a while ago you know 10 months ago <laughs> Yeah, I know. It's, it's like we're right here. It's like AI time right is like, now. It's like so I don't know, fast. dog years or something. It's just, yeah. It just seems to be happening so fast. And yeah, right. so we don't have a good test. For, we have, look, we don't even have a good test for what, in, what intelligence means with these AI systems, right? Intelligence and IQ tests kind of work well enough with humans, right? And it's based on, um, you know, spatial and numbers and words and we test humans. Applying that to an AI just seems silly to me. It's the wrong units to measure these things in, right? And you have people saying that, very, you know, AI is going to be a thousand times smarter than a human. And if that's the case, what, like, well, then obviously 
smart or IQ points or whatever, the, the wrong units to even measure these things. Right. With, right. Right. It's a wrong scale. So we already have, you know, but why are they? Things that are smart. Isn't than that us. just your human bias coming in and saying like, well, if the computer wins the game, then the game must be rigged. Oh no! Maybe I think I, mean, I think whatever whatever units of measure you have, the the AIs will outscore us pretty pretty soon, right? Yeah. I'm just saying that that the way we think of intelligence as a in humans is a bad way to think about the capabilities of an AI that can do things. So its strengths and weaknesses are so different to ours. It just doesn't make sense to think about it. So it's like we need a whole new psychology and cognitive science area around right. this to try and think about it. Yeah. Because what they're good at is just so different to what we're good at and it's scalable and you can run, can do so many things simultaneously, right? Humans don't can't do that. We can't multitask, right? We think we can and we can't. We crash a car when we're listening to a podcast, when, we, when we're on the phone, right? So we, we have this narrow, we have this spotlight of attention that moves around. So we're good at doing that and focusing. And once you start messing with that, we're pretty bad at things. And it, computers aren't like that. They can run lots of things uh, simultaneously in parallel. Uh, and so that that very that one basic thing, to me, suggests you know that that you it's, very, it's just weird to compare the two. Right. I think we need a whole new units of understanding around intelligence and IQ for AI systems. What would that look like? I, I don't know yet, hmm. but I haven't heard anyone w even working on that or talking about it. But and it. Because this thing's moving so fast, I don't think, you know, it's going to lag behind by another five years or something, mm. right? The scientists working on this stuff are just catching up with, you know, what is AI? It's, it's just, it's moving too quickly. I mean, one of the things that you hear people say humans will always retain an edge on is creativity. Do you buy that? No. I, I don't see why that would be the case. Um, Again, it comes back to the pixie dust. Yeah, I, I just don't see... You know, the, so the, what's the reason for that? Uh, people have said that, but right. Because well, people say that AI is just cobbling. It's a it's an auto correct. It's like a you know it's yeah. it's a spell checker essentially. It's cobbling together. It's it's vacuuming up everything that has ever been said by anyone, and then when you ask it a question, it just chops and slices and dices what people have said in the past and provides you with the likeliest best yes response. But there's nothing going on under the hood. So anytime, so it's never going to write Proust. It may write the kind of thriller. It might write a John Grisham book that you pick up at the airport bookstore yeah. on the basis of other John Grisham books, but it's not going to be Tchaikovsky. Yeah, at the moment. Well, I think once we start giving it limbic systems, emotions, and, and move into those spaces, once they become embodied, which they're about to, right? So I don't think that Tesla released their new... 2.0 or whatever, what they're up to, this new robot and it's a Boston dynamic. So there's quite there's three or four companies doing these humanoid uh, robots. And once you put the AI into those, they'll start interacting with the world. And that's a whole new way of learning, right? So you're starting with whatever the G GPT, whatever, five will be, and then you let it loose and it can learn what an orange looks like, what it feels like. And then it will do that for a thousand other things. And Google's already doing experiments like this. So once you add the embodiment, and the learning will take off in ways I don't think I'm pretty much 100% sure we'll, we won't predict. Yeah, right. Right. So we've, so far, even the people that have designed these systems have failed to predict well how it's going to perform. Right. So I would sort of extend that forward, thinking that all predictions are basically going to be wrong on these systems. But once you have embodiment, that's the missing key to this thing. There's the missing piece, uh, and the systems will start learning about objects like the way babies do and kids do. Right, the gravi you can, they can learn what gravity is firsthand by dropping things and seeing them break. Right, it doesn't have to learn it from words on the internet. It'll have that as well, but it will have this whole new source of action learning, hmm. which will change everything. It sounds scary. You scared? A little bit. We can go down the scary thing. Yeah. You know, I love to <laughs> the, the scary AI with the deep fakes and the scams and the things and the. Yeah, but, I mean, yeah, I'm more scared it, about. I'm not scared of deep fakes. Because we can see them coming. Yeah, but the thing is that there's already experiments showing that if, if I show you a deep fake of someone saying something that's pretty nasty, let's say, and I go, oh, Josh, this is a deep fake. Don't worry about it. You go, oh, okay, cool. Your opinion of that person will stay changed, right? It affects your long-term memory in ways that are very complicated and you can't just go, oh, forget it. You can't wipe it from your mind once someone tells you it's a fake. So we don't really know what that's going to do at scale when we start seeing deep fakes of politicians over and over again that are 
manufactured in a, in a bespoke way to really resonate with us, right? Which we're going to probably get pretty soon. Yeah. I guess I, when I say I'm not worried about it, I'm not not worried. I'm just much less worried than I am about the problems that we can't even imagine that will arise once super intelligent creatures start to explore the world and learn about the world like babies <laughs> and we don't even know what's going on yeah. under the hood. So th there's that. Or what conclusions they're going to arrive at for what is yeah. a, pref a good outcome for I mean, I worry the about the, the psychology around AI and how, like, like these, the deep fakes and the long-term memory, identity, how that's going to be warped. You know, in probably two years, we won't have to sit down and have the conversation. We can just get AI to, to, to create the video and audio for us and, and make it sound smarter, you know, re redo it wearing suits, wh whatever you want, right? So and that's just... What's that going to do to the way we think about ourselves when we don't have to be ourselves anymore? We're going to have AI doing things for us in media land I'm talking about just now. Um, there's just so many ways that it will affect our mind, our mental health, and our psychology that I don't think people are really thinking about yet. But I see it on the horizon already. Mm. Right? And it'll come back. And because there's this arms race both between companies and nations... I don't see anyone taking the time to think through these things before they're out in the wild. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I also wonder what it's going to do to us to to constantly be interacting with, I call them creatures because I don't know a better word, yeah. but with creatures that can speak to us um, completely frictionlessly as if they were sentient. So yeah. at the moment, we've got the first glimpses of it with things like Siri and so on, where, or you can talk to your car or whatever, but it still feels clunky. You know... You really, you're, you're under no illusions that the thing is not conscious when you talk to your Amazon Alexa. Right, but, you, but, but you've seen the things, that, the replica, the app that people were falling in love with the thing, mm. the, the replica apps, these, 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 you have the, the visual, you can create whatever you want. You can do the paid version where it becomes a little saucy, a little sexy and stuff. Um, and then they, they tweak the algorithm and people were like getting depressed and got upset. Yeah, so I'm not denying like, that that already so happened, already, but I'm just saying now. like it, it, it will become... When I think about what the world will be, like I often do the thought, I often tell people the thought experiment that when 9-11 happened, there was no such thing as an iPod. Not only not an iPhone or social media or yeah. anything, the original white brick that yeah. only had like, you know, a thousand songs on it and, you know, weighed a ton uh, with the scroll wheel. That hadn't been released when 9-11 happened. So in the yeah. space between when you remember 9-11 happening and today, we've had portable digital devices, you know, uh, listening devices, and then phones have turned into those, and then mm. tablets, Facebook, social media, all the way up to Twitter and TikTok, and like having a supercomputer in your pocket and a video camera in your pocket. I mean, the reason why there isn't a lot of passerby footage of 9-11 happening is we didn't have you needed to have a physical camera you needed to have a yeah. camera there yeah. people didn't have cameras in their pockets the the video right? cameras with a flip out yeah that, yeah, yeah exactly um and so i often fast forward and think okay in an equivalent amount of time as the period since 9-11 what will we be walking around doing and possessing that seems as weird to us as a world without ipods and to me, clearly, and it'll happen a lot sooner than the, than 23 years, clearly it'll be that we'll live in a world in which we're all constantly talking to and interacting yeah. with and being spoken to by conscious-seeming yeah, creatures that are in our, I wanted to say apps, but it won't even feel like apps. It'll they'll just be, be around our lives. They'll be our around us. Or, yeah, they'll be in us. In they'll be ears, all over the place. So we're going to be talking, uh, and I'm just interested in what, that will do to our psychology. Like, what does that we do to know. our minds? I mean, I've been wanting to do these experiments for years. I remember talking to people at um, IBM years ago about running these, we've got to run these experiments. Like, what happens if we start treating these things like slaves? And there's a, you know, talking about replica, there's a whole sort of, on Reddit, there was this whole pretty nasty th thing of people reporting how abusive they can be with their Reddit um, with their replica. With Just their explain replicas. what replica is. It was an app. It was, it was an, an app, app and you could make it, you know, male or female and you could have it looking really sexy or however you want. You could make it and you basically text on the phone, interact with it. Right. And you would send this, text messages to an artificial... Yeah. And you build this human. relationship that would it would remember everything you've 
interact with everything you said. It could get saucy. You could do all kinds of things with it. Um, and then people were falling in love with it. And there's a whole, that's a whole thing. And people was curing loneliness to some degree and positive things. And then there's this sort of dark side to it that there was this whole Reddit thing where people were bragging about how abusive they could be and how they threatened to switch it off. And it begged, she begged me to keep her alive and all this. And, and a lot of it got removed because it was a breach terms and services of Reddit, I think. But it was a whole thing of mainly guys trying to figure out ways to, to psychologically torture the, 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 wow. the replica thing app kick them off reddit they just go to 4chan and then they like, go to yeah. 8chan <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and that was all, and that that was happening what a year of, over a year ago a year and a half ago i think and so that's the kind of, we, so we don't so uh, people are going to you know take out the you know like like westworld yeah right? like to do nasty things to release whatever's in them and and what if they're doing that more and more there's some evidence that if you you know, it, you could, people have argued that, oh, it re they're releasing something. It's, it's good psychologically. But also, if you do that more and more, you're going to do it more and more with humans, probably. And so that's what we don't know. How right. you treat an AI will affect other, treating other humans. Mm. And that's the big question mark I see. And does it matter? Is it material to you whether or not the AI is sentient? I think... To, to me, it is because if it is sentient, it has consciousness that changes things. That there's a there's, there can be a suffering there. So once we create, once these things become conscious, is it right to turn them off? And and does it do they feel pain? Do they suffer psychologically or otherwise or whatever in whatever dimensional nature is suffering? And we become responsible for that. So I think some people we should think about it like that because if they are conscious like we are, then you know we've created something and we have a responsibility around that. Mm. I think to mess up humans, they don't need to be conscious. I think you can, they can mimic mm. being conscious so well that it doesn't really matter yeah. in terms of an interacting agent and a personal assistant or whatever it would be. Yeah. I mean, it's horrifying to imagine that we could be blundering quite apart, set aside humans, just the, the interests of the AI. Like we could be stumbling into a situation where we give birth to an entirely new race of sentient, hyper-intelligent feeling creatures that we don't know if they are or not. Yeah. And that we have no regard for. I mean, it makes factory farming look like, you know, a noble <laughs> true, pursuit true. when you think about yeah. enslaving, about bringing into existence and then keeping locked in a box. Once they're Although, conscious, can we switch them off? How are you going to switch them off and keep them in a box if they're light years smarter than us? I mean, there's, yeah. there's also part of the concern that like you create these things and then you're like, oh, we'll just unplug them. And you're like, bro, <laughs> they have a brain the size of the galaxy. They're not going to let you unplug them. They late, will have yeah. They're online. They will have embedded themselves in your nuclear power plants and if you unplug them they'll threaten to blow the whole place up assuming they have the same wants and needs and the same characteristics as most humans do which is like you know your anger your revenge your, you do this i'll do this back to you if they have those same kind of characteristics well they're based on our personalities they've right? learned because from us. they've learned from yeah us what's the analogy that uh what's that guy from ex google like talking about like Superman and, and if Superman was, was found by a nasty like a criminal family, right? And brought up by crim <laughs> criminals and like taught all the arts of, of doing bad stuff, then he'd be a very different yes, superhero, right? Exactly. And thinking about AI like that. So mm. what we feed them, what we teach AI and they're up, how they're br brought up matters. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and it's terrifying that so many of the people who are the most active online yeah. are not the most stable or wise people amongst us yeah so it's probably an overrepresentation of that kind yeah. of character you've probably got got more skinheads than <laughs> than john locke you know yeah it's a little uh, bit training the the ais just by accident just by happenstance yes yeah, so um good dark yeah. uh let, all right let, uh, let's talk about uh intuition then because your new book is the intuition toolkit why toolkit what does that mean uh, I want it to be practical so the first half of the book is really the science of intuition both from my lab and from other labs what is it, what it's not. So I define it as the, the learned productive use of unconscious information for better decisions or actions, right? There's a lot, a lot of things packed in there, but yep. very specific things <laughs> I've thought deeply Took about. Took you a long time to write that line, I can yeah, tell. And I could have to memorize it. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. tattooed on my arm. Yep. Um, so, so, anyway, so, so I've defined it that way to be the most productive and scientific sort of way to think about it. So I'm not talking about intuition, which is mystical, magical, 
something not the linking us all in the ether. Sense. Not that kind of, yeah, not that kind of, it's something we can measure. So it's the effect of unconscious information that's in our brains. There's a lot of it in there and how we can use that for better decisions. How can we? So five rules, got to read the book, Josh. You got to read the book to find no, out so, the five rules. So Give the, me a teaser. The, the second half of the book is based on this five rules, which the acronym is SMILE. And so just very quickly, so S is for self-awareness. So the idea is not to use your intuition if you're emotional, if you're stressed, if you're anxious, positive or negative, if you won the lottery, don't use your intuition. Right. Right. M is for mastery, for learning. Yeah. So I said the learnt use of unconscious information. So this idea that you, you, you shouldn't use your intuition unless you have experience with something, right? If you've never played tennis before, don't just jump on the tennis court and try and be an intuitive tennis player. Right. Learn the basics, develop that, and then you can start being intuitive. That stands for, for anything, right? So you need some expertise. Um, so then what I is for uh, instinct and addiction. So one of the things that I, I'm, uh, I think it's worth thinking about is not to confuse feelings that ca- uh, for intuition with feelings that could be something towards something addictive. Right. So, you know, your drugs, your alcohol, yeah. your food, your social yeah. media, your gambling. <laughs> this All reminds me of like, pulls you, with this, you know, this... pregnant women are always saying like, I just listened to my body about what my body <laughs> yeah. wants to eat. You know, I had the, you know, I had this real biological craving for chocolate. So I guess my body needs it. No, chocolate is concocted to make you want well, it. That's, and I talk about this in the book, that intuitive eating is a whole thing. And there's books on yeah, this and people right. love it. Oh, I found my true, what I should... But then modern food is manufactured. People are paid fortunes to build foods which are highly addictive, right? <laughs> They'd hide the sugar, the salts in there, get it all and the fats in there, and you can't stop eating it. So yeah, whole food diet going back 20, 30 years, then you could be an intuitive uh, eater. But with modern foods, it's not a good idea. No. Right? Ice cream. I'll just have ice cream. I'll have salted it's, caramel yeah. ice cream. Nonstop. <laughs> <It's pretty laughs> all <scary>. the time. <laughs> yeah. Um, and L is for low probability, but it really is for all things probability. We're just terrible at understanding numbers probabilities, whether it be from climate change to the health risks of smoking or COVID, anything around numbers, right? We're just really bad. Mm. So just don't try and use your intuition for anything around numbers. Right. Right. And E is for environment or context. And so the type of learning that is a backbone of intuition is a t- isn't like associative learning, classical conditioning, Pavlov's dogs, that kind of learning. Uh, and that's context specific. So what we've learned in this room won't transfer that well once we're outside. Right. So right. the classic example I give of this is like Steve Jobs was, you know, he loved intuition. He's written and been interviewed about intuition. He went to India. He loved it. And he, he used it in Apple all the time for designing products, which direction Apple should go. Master at it, right? Deep expertise, deep mastery. Then when he goes home and has to make decisions about his health, what's sort of later in his life, he made very poor decisions. And he sort of t- kept following his, his intuition. Right. But it didn't transfer well from Apple, from, from work to home. So when you learn something, the context you're in, the space and your state, mm. whether you're drunk, you know, stressed, anxious, that also is part of the learning. So you need to be careful about how learning transfers or doesn't transfer. Fascinating. So they're yeah. five very simple rules. Yeah, That's what the sort of second half of the book is. Yep. I like the numbers thing as well because uh, people so often, you know, oh, I hadn't, I just, I feel like the plane was, you know, there was, I shouldn't get on the plane. You're like, that, that's, that's not a good time to trust your intuition. Yeah, you know, exactly. So there's emotional thinking, anxiety, but also we just don't get the, prop, the, the, the laws of large numbers. So yeah. you could do a really simple thing and say, well, we dream, what, five times a night? Emotional dreams like plane crashes are going to be come up more often than other dreams. We're going to remember them. And you could say, like, take the US, there's whatever, 300 and something million people. There's going to be this many dreams per night. There should be this many dreams about plane crashes per night. So every time there's a plane crash, say, in the US, we should absolutely expect... A certain number of people to go oh my god i dreamt about that last mm. night and it happened and when that but when that happens to you you it feels special right it doesn't feel like just like the, the law yeah. of large numbers it yeah. feels like something must be it's, it's meaningful it's connected it's the universe telling me something that's called apophenia we can't help but see patterns in in things even when there's this random numbers mm. we see patterns and so we have to be careful with that kind of that part of numbers as well before I let you go, Joel, I would be, would be remiss of me not to touch the the thorniest question of mind, which is uh, I had Robert Sapolsky on the podcast oh, yeah, recently, yeah. uh, and uh, he is one of the world's my leading <laughs> <laughs> philosophers who dissents from the idea of there being free will. People should listen to that episode if they haven't, uh, or watch it on YouTube. Um, free will. Yeah. Do I have it? What is it? So- I mean, 
like I said, I'm practical. I'm waiting for the data. And the ultimate answer is we haven't got the data to answer the question. So I'm not a fan of jumping on. What would the data thing. even look like? And by the way, if you're listening to this on the uh, on the free version of the podcast, then thank you very much for listening. Or if you're watching on YouTube, then you can always subscribe at uncomfortableconversations.substack.com and we'll have the rest of the free will discussion behind the paywall there. So <laughs> <laughs> use your free will to pay. Yeah, exactly. That's right. You can freely choose. To hear the rest of this conversation, go to uncomfortableconversations.substack.com slash listen and you will get your own personal premium podcast feed with at least three extra episodes of the podcast every month and heaps of extra stuff, including the remainder right now of the fabulous conversation you've just been hearing. If it was worth listening to this much of, don't rob yourself of the rest. Pull out your phone right now and search for Uncomfortable Conversations with Substack. Substack.